Well, good morning again, everybody. So glad you're with us today. If we've not met, my name is Joel. I have the honor of being the lead pastor. And if we have met, my name is still Joel. And uh, we've met, and you should know my name by now. I mean, come on. Uh, glad you're with us today. For those of you who are joining us online, whenever and wherever you are, we're so glad that you're with us today. And while we're so glad that you're there, you will love it when you are here. Although I have to admit, if you're anywhere close to us, it's going to be really hot from you getting to your, your, car, your house, to your car, to in here. But in here, it feels great. Up here, it's a little warm, but it'd be great out there. So join us when you're able, and we'll just be so glad when you can. Those of you who are guests in house, thanks for being here. We hope you stop by the guest center amidst all the craziness of the barbecue today and allow us to give you a gift. It's a way of saying thanks for being with us and connect a little bit. I wanna, I'm going to start today talking about embracing our pride. Now, we just finished a month where our culture talks a lot about pride, but normally we don't use that in a positive sense. Normally pride's a bad thing right? I mean, we'll say, man, that person is so prideful. Oh, they're so, oh, we have other words for it. We, they're so conceited. They're so haughty. I love that one. Arrogant. There's, these are not positive words. You never look at someone and go, man, I've heard so many good things about you. I've heard that you are so arrogant. <laughs> if you do, oh my goodness, you need to get a little social grace. You don't say that to someone's face. That's the things you gossip about behind their back. I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Although you're going to do it anyway. I'm just kidding. Okay. But, but we don't normally say this in a positive way. And yet, how much pride do we embrace in our own hearts and we cover it up? Now, back in 2011, a movie came out called Thor, and it was about Thor. And this Marvel movie told, had the story, their version of what the Thor was like. And in the opening scene of this movie, it establishes his backstory and what's going on with him. And he goes off in his pride and his arrogance, and he starts a war. And then he comes back thinking he's going to be hailed as a victor and just, you know, the next king of the world type thing. And his father is none too pleased, kicks him out of Asgard and takes away his hammer, banishes him to earth. And that's the rest of the movie unfolds from him trying to get a handle on his own pride and to become worthy again of carrying the hammer and all that. If you've seen the movie, then you, you know how it works. But the whole point of Thor is his pride was his destruction. It was his undoing. We never use pride in a positive sense. But how many times do we as disciples of Jesus embrace way too much pride? And Christian pride is interesting. There's kind of two extremes on this. One extreme is the Christian pride of, of kind of more legalism. It's the, you look the part and you know the right things to say Maybe you know the Beatitudes, you know the books of the Bible, you know all this stuff, but you don't actually live like it. And so actually you're, you're, hip, you're a hypocrite. But that's a form of Christian pride. It's, it's acceptable. We accept that and we say, oh, that's a good Christian. We accept it. But it actually is pride. That's the pride of, of, of what they are and, and their standing and their status. Then you have the other extreme in Christianity. And this other pride, we compliment just as much and it's just as weird. This is the kind of pride of the person that will tell you how messed up they are. And they're still just as messed up today as they were 10 years ago when they found Jesus. They're always messed up. They're never actually healed of anything. They're never actually better. They never actually grow. They're just constantly telling you how messed up they are. And we applaud those people too. Both of those are prideful. Both of those are sinful. Both of those are wrong. But yet both of those get accepted in the Christian circle. And so we live somewhere in the, in, the, in the middle of this tension, the middle of these extremes, and we embrace this pride of what a Christian's supposed to be. Either we're trying just to look the part and not be the part, or we're just trying to tell people how much that we're just a sinner and rotten that we don't actually grow. And yet on both sides of that, we have to understand that both extremes, and really all of it in the middle, it's actually offensive to God. That all of our sin, every single bit drop of our sin, is an open assault against heaven. It, it, it is open conflict and starting a war with heaven with every single sin we commit. Now the problem is we don't think of it that way. We don't normally think of it like that. We don't normally go through life and go, oh man, when I did that, then I, I, I offended God. We just kind of go, eh, that's how I am. Or on the flip side, we just never even admit we're wrong. And it's acceptable but it's not acceptable to God. So when we talk about embracing pride, we've got to understand that the problem is us. We embrace this pride in us. We hang on to it, not realizing that we're actually assaulting heaven every single time. 
So today as we start this series, New Creations, we're starting this series and it goes all the way through the end of August and it emphasizes how the power of God is transforming, present tense, transforming us. That he's not done with us just because we received him as Savior or that we committed our lives to him. That, that's not where it stops, that's where it begins And it continues, and He is constantly transforming us. He's making us into new creations. We're going to talk a lot about that in this series, about this three-part tension of I have been saved, I am saved, and I am still being saved. It's all of that. And today, we're going to talk about our greatest need. And you probably can figure out our greatest need is not going to be embracing pride. Our greatest need is going to be trying to acknowledge that and actually letting the Holy Spirit deal with that. And we're going to see that from the book of Amos, way back in the Old Testament, little tiny book in the Old Testament called one of the minor prophets. And they're called minor prophets, not because they're less important, but because they're the small books. Okay, back in the Old Testament, book of Amos. And we're going to jump in the middle of this on chapter 7. And Amos is prophesying somewhere around 760 B.C. to 750 B.C. Now, I will forgive you if you don't have suddenly all these connections and alarm bells in your head going off to go, whoa, that's pretty significant. I'll understand if you don't quite get it. I'm the history buff, so for me, I get it. I love history. The reason that's significant that he is finishing up around 750 B.C. is because in 722 B.C., just 30 years-ish later, the northern kingdom of Israel falls to tiglath pileser III of Assyria. That's significant to know because of everything Amos is about to say is prophesying towards that event. That hasn't happened from his perspective. We know it as history. For him, it's prophecy. So we're going to jump in the middle of this. Uh, Verses 7 through 9, Amos writes this. This is what the Lord showed me. The Lord was standing by a wall that had been built true to plumb, with a plumb line in his hand, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord asked me, what do you see, Amos? A plumb line, I replied. Then the Lord said, look, I am setting a plumb line among my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. The high places of Isaac will be destroyed and the sanctuaries of Israel will be ruined. With my sword, I will rise up against the house of Jeroboam. Now, the foundation of this prophecy is found in this vision of the Lord's plumb line. Now, if you're not in any trade, you might think the word plumb and you might only think of plumbing as in water and sewage. That's one use. But people who are in carpentry have another use of it. And that term plumb is the parallel to the term level. You've heard level. Level is when something is horizontally true. When it's vertically true, it's called plumb. Now, I was going to show you what a plumb bob looked like on a line, but it was so small you couldn't see it. So I did it with a tennis ball. I know, for those of you who are in carpentry, I know this is not an actual plumb bob. I did it so they could see, so back off. Okay. If that could actually hang and my hand didn't shake, what you'd find is this amazing thing, and that is the weight of the the plumb bob, or in this case, my tennis ball, is going to hold that straight down. And so no matter what I hold this against, it's going to show what is really vertical, what is really straight up and down, what is really 90 degrees to the bottom here, okay? It's going to really show if it's right or not. And that's what the Lord is doing to his people. He says, I have a plumb line, and it's called my holiness, my standard, my righteousness, my justice. I'm holding it against my people, and I have found that they are not just a little bit off. They are a lot off. They're so far off that the only solution I have is to destroy it and start over. Because if you, if you built something and you have found that it's not level, or if it's not plumb, you will find that there are some things you can do to repair it, and then there are some things, sometimes, all you can do is destroy it and start over. And I'll have to say right here, I am not built for this heat. I am built for winter and not summer, so I am sweating. I am sorry. I'm just going to keep wiping, and we're going to keep going. I know it's shiny right here. I know, and that's it. I'm just going to wipe and keep going. I'm sorry. Okay, so... So the Lord has this plumb line, and he says specifically what's going on here. Because we look at this and we say, man, this is pretty rough. This is, I mean, like that escalated fast because we just jump in the middle of this. But he said, the high places and sanctuaries, he starts there. Now that's referring to their national religion. Old Testament Israel is not the same as the United States. Okay, so you can't take America and read it back to the Old Testament. America is a constitutional republic. We specifically have laws in the Constitution that prohibits the government from establishing religion. 
That's not true for Old Testament Israel. Their government was religion, okay? The Old Testament law was their governing law. They were a theocracy. That is, they were a kingship, a monarchy under the kingship of God. Very different setup than what we have in America. They didn't vote people in. They just followed the king, and the king represented God. But the high places and sanctuaries, that was was the seat of their religion, but they had defiled that religion. They had defiled what God had told them to do, and they had basically taken all the practices of the nations around them and just did them themselves in the name of God. So one particular example that's going to come in later is that they had these fertility practices in the nations around them. And so what happened is the farmers and the ranchers and the the shepherds, they would go to this, this high place or this sanctuary or this little temple, and they would have sex with a fertility um, priestess. And when they did that, her fertility would then bless the land and make the land fertile, make the land grow, or it would give them more flocks or make their cows milk better. That's weird to us, I know, but that's what they did. And Israel had taken on that practice by this point in history. And so they, they, they didn't call it that, but that's what it was. They brought in all their same practices, and the Lord is saying, that is the exact opposite of what I told you to do. You are taking everything I made, and you're polluting it, and worse, they were doing it in his name, as if the Lord had told them to do this. That's blasphemy, and that's a problem. But he also says the house of Jeroboam, which is a big fancy way of saying that's their seat of government, because the king was supposed to be God's representative on earth. He was supposed to be the representative of God's justice. He was the top of their judiciary branch, okay, if you think of it in our terms. But the kings weren't doing that anymore. They weren't giving justice to the people. They were giving justice to their rich friends, and they were giving justice to the people that had connections with them, and they were corrupt. And the Lord is saying, again, you're doing this in my name. You represent me. And so as he held his standard up to his people, He said, you are not kind of off. You are way off. You're not even in the same building I'm measuring. You're just kind of dressing it up and using my name for it, but it's not even me anymore. Now, with a a declaration like that, there's going to be a reaction. The prophets would often get a reaction, and this was the reaction that we see here between the prophet, Amos, and a priest. So now, that sounds like the beginning of a joke, right? A prophet and a priest walk into it. The priest is who we're about to come into contact with. So the priest would represent, you know, the head of their their religion. This was their pastor. And this was his response to this. Verses 10 and 11. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent a message to Jeroboam, king of Israel. Amos is raising a conspiracy against you in the very heart of Israel. The land cannot bear all his words. For this is what Amos is saying. Jeroboam would die by the sword, and Israel would surely go into exile away from their native land. This is a serious charge. I mean, this this is a charge of treason, sedition. I mean, you hang people for this kind of stuff. This This is bad. And he's accusing Amos, the prophet, of doing this. And he's saying, well, actually, what he's saying is true. That is actually what Amos said. (laughs) He's not even making it up. Amos actually said those words. But Amaziah is leaving all the context out of it. And he's just telling Jeroboam, not Jeroboam the first. He's several Jeroboams down the road, okay? They kept the same name a lot of times, but he's telling this Jeroboam, hey, this guy's trying to overthrow you. And there's that phrase, maybe you caught it, where he said, the land cannot bear all his words. That seems strange to us, but put it back in the fertility cults. If the people didn't do what the priests were telling them to do, these fertility practices then they believed the land would be barren, that they wouldn't have crops, that they wouldn't have have meat anymore, they wouldn't have any prosperity. Because Amos is telling them, you need to stop doing this and go back and be faithful to your wives and stop this. That's the other thing Amos was saying. It's just before we got to chapter 7. That's where that phrase comes from. Is Amaziah saying, no, 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 this Jeroboam, if he does this, we're all in trouble. And let's bear in mind, the priest had something to protect. He had his position to protect. He had his own pride. He had his own station in life that he didn't want to lose. And if the people actually did what Amos said, it would point a finger right at Amaziah. And he would have to admit that he didn't do all these things Amos told them he was supposed to be doing. You see, you can't have Amos being right because that makes Amaziah wrong. And that is simply not going to happen in his religious worldview. So we go on, verses 12 through 15. Then Amaziah said to Amos, 
So now he's directly talking to him. He says, get out, you seer. Go back to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there and do your prophesying there. Don't prophesy anymore at Bethel. This is the king's sanctuary and the temple of the kingdom. Amos answered Amaziah, I was neither a prophet nor a son of a prophet, but I was a shepherd, and I also took care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord took me from tending the flock and said to me, Go and prophesy to my people Israel. Now, let me bring you up on some more history here. Israel and Judah, they're both referenced, and they're different places. Okay, by this point in the Old Testament, when you get past the son of Solomon, okay, so you have David, Solomon, his son. Past that, there's two kingdoms, civil war, and they, they were in two kingdoms more than they were in one, historically speaking. Northern kingdom was, it was Israel. They were all the aristocrats. Okay, they were all the wealthy royal people. The southerners, they were, they were the land of Judah. They were the farmers and the shepherds and the people that did trees. They were those people. So you can hear then Amaziah's disdain towards Amos. He's like, you're not even a native of Israel. You're someone from Judah. Go back down there with those people and prophesy to them. We don't want to hear it anymore. I don't need to hear somebody from Judah telling us in Israel how to do our business. Go back down there where you came from and just tell them whatever you want to tell them. And I love Amos' response. I, his response, I mean, I tried to read it as gentle as I think he said it. I, I don't know how he said it. But I love his response. He's like, man, you're right. I'm not like you. The priest were, you were a priest because your father was a priest. And he was a priest because his father was a priest. And he was a priest because his father was a priest. The prophets didn't work this way. They were just these regular guys. And then God calls them out and they do something else. And Amos goes, you're right. I'm not a prophet. <laughs> I'm not the son of a prophet. I was a shepherd. And I also, and I love these specific, he says, I also raised sycamore fig trees. I love this guy because he's like, look, I also did this. I wasn't just a shepherd. I also did this, but, and the Lord told me, go and do this. So the contrast Amos is making is not between, well, this was my life then and here's my life now. The contrast scripture is pointing out is here is Amaziah, the priest who was to study the law and the word of God morning, noon, and night and missed it by a mile. And here's the shepherd tree guy who completely gets it. And when the Lord says go, he said, absolutely, and headed north. That's the contrast. That's what we're supposed to see there. That here's a prophet who understood it completely and a priest who was so busy protecting everything, protecting his way of life that he's leading the people to destruction. Oh, oh, and guiding the king to do the same because in Old Testament Israel, the prophet was supposed to have a place in the court. He was supposed to be the king's main advisor. So here's a guy coming along saying, I'm a prophet. And the priest is saying, no, 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 you're not going to get within 30 yards of Jeroboam. The last place you're going to go is here in Bethel. You're not going to go to the king's court. The king, no, no, you're going to go back down south. You're going to tell that king whatever you want to tell that king. And the clock is ticking. We know it as history. Amos knows it as prophecy. Some 30 years within Amos' lifetime, he would see these words come true. And he knows it because this is the message the Lord told him. And so Amos, excuse me, Amos now has to give a response to Amaziah. You don't just get caught out like that and just do nothing, okay? He's got to say something else. Here's what he says in verses 16 and 17. Amos says, Now then, hear the word of the Lord. You say do not prophesy against Israel and stop preaching against the descendants of Isaac. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. Your wife will become a prostitute in the city, and your sons and daughters will fall by the sword. Your land will be measured and divided up, and you yourself will die in a pagan country. And Israel will surely go into exile, away from their native land. That's harsh, right? That's tough. True, but tough. And it's easy for us to look at this and see it in isolation and to say, man, that, that Amos was really, whew, he did not know how to influence people very well. That's hard. But you've got to bear in mind, Amos was simply the next in line of a lot of prophets who've been saying the same thing, begging God's people to turn from their wickedness, turn back to the Lord. The Lord is sending these mouthpieces, begging them to come home, begging them to repent, begging them to turn back. And the people keep saying, nope, because the priest keeps saying, nope and the king keeps saying absolutely nope 
And so we're looking at the end of the story because God cares tremendously how his people behave. His people in the Old Testament were specifically called to be a light to the Gentiles. Gentile meaning non-Jewish people. They were supposed to be a light to show them this is how God's people live. Isn't God good? See, some of us as non-Jewish people, we look at the Old Testament and we just go, man, look at all they had to do. This is terrible. Thank goodness I'm under grace. But to them, that was grace. Because all the so-called gods of other, other nations never told their people how to live, so they would do horrible things. They'd cut themselves. They'd mark themselves up. That's why the law prohibited the Jewish people from doing those things. Because the pagans did that. The other people did that. They would sacrifice their children to these pagan gods because their gods never told them how to live. And the Lord came along and said, I'm going to show you exactly how to live. This is how to live and receive my blessing. You don't have to wonder. This is the path to my blessing. But if you choose this, this is the path to my judgment. But I love the Lord always goes, but choose this and I'll bless you. They already knew all that. The king was commanded by God in scripture to read the law every year out loud to the people. He probably didn't do it that much. But he was supposed to read it himself. The priest was supposed to know this and teach the people this. The fathers were supposed to teach their families this. They weren't doing that. But they knew what they were supposed to do. So now the question becomes, do we think that just because we're on this side of the cross, God suddenly doesn't care how we live? Does he care less because of Jesus? Does it matter less how we live now? Do we get to embrace our religious pride like Amaziah? Or do we get to embrace our never-ending brokenness? Is that what Jesus came to give us? Just more of the same? Or did he expect something else? You see, if we choose to do it our way, we can. I mean, the reality is you are, you have this amazing gift God gave you called free will. You can do that. You can live that way. But if you do, the words of Amos ring in your heart and ring in your head from the Lord telling us that the unrepentant embrace catastrophe the unrepentant embrace catastrophe that's what Amos is saying that if nothing else our our dumb decisions will simply work themselves out to the only conclusion they can produce which is dumb okay if you if, if you if you play dumb games you win dumb prizes or stated more theologically the unrepentant embrace catastrophe that if we do this our way, we're only going to get our way. We know where that goes. We see it every day in our society. We know where that goes. So why do we do it? I mean, receiving the gift of eternal life from Jesus is an amazing gift. But listen, that always is preceded by an understanding of how sinful we are. Because if we don't, then we're unrepentant. And the unrepentant embrace catastrophe. See, the reality is until you know how bad the bad news is, you don't understand the good news. It's not good if you don't know how bad it is. That's why we call it good news or the gospel because we know how bad it is. And if we stay on that bad path, then we're embracing unrepentance and the unrepentant ultimately embrace catastrophe. And I know there might be some who would say, Joel, you're, you're trying to put us under the law again. You're trying to make us more into this kind of look the right way and talk the right way and, and just fake. I don't want to be fake. And I'm not saying that. I can see where you could draw that conclusion, but I'm not saying that. But here's what the Apostle Paul had to say. You don't have to take my word for it. Scripture actually addresses that. It says this, Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace can increase? You know, can I just go out and just live it my way because I'm going to show how faithful God is to forgive? Paul goes, by no means. Absolutely not. Well, maybe put, if Paul was writing today, maybe the Holy Spirit would, ask, would, would, would uh, inspire him to write. That's crazy talk. He says, we are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? But Paul's not done yet. He writes, or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? 
We are therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of God the Father, we too may live a new life. And I wonder how many of us embrace the old life and try to pass it off as the new one. How much of the old life can I keep, Joel? How much sin can I do before God cares? He cares about all of it. That's who you were. Beloved, that is not who you are anymore. Paul says you are dead to that. That, that, is, that person died. But if we're unrepentant and we want to live that life and we want to have a, just a little bit of taste of the water, Joel, I don't want to be weird. Scripture says if you do it right, you're going to be weird. Okay, technically it said peculiar. But that's weird. Well, Joel, I, I, just, I, I just want to... No, that's who you were. That's unrepentant. And the unrepentant embrace catastrophe. Which means we always have this choice. Do we embrace our pride? Do we embrace embrace trying to do it our way? Do we embrace trying just to entertain a lot more sin than we really should? Or maybe just kind of wearing it on our sleeve and telling everybody how much of a great sinner we are so that grace can be shown to be even more faithful, even though Paul said absolutely not. Or do we embrace his mercy? Choice is yours. I can't make the choice for you. That's your choice. Which which are we going to embrace? Our way or his mercy? You see, disciples of Jesus are made new. That, that is, big word, ontological reality. That is, look it up, impress all your friends, ontological, great word. Impress all your friends with that one. That is who you are. It's not a state of being, it is who you are. You are made new as a disciple of Jesus. Who you were is dead. You say, Joel, it doesn't always feel dead. I know, I know the old person doesn't feel dead because he still lives in here with me. Paul wrote about that too. The things I want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, I do. And he goes, who can save this wretched man? Jesus can. We are made new. That is who you are, beloved. That's that's what Jesus died to do. He died to make you a new person. That's not who you are anymore. Does that mean you're going to be perfect? No. But you are forgiven. And you are redeemed. Do we act like it? Do we act like people that have been made new? Also, I want to encourage you to praise the Lord for His mercy. Praise Him for His mercy. Now, some people use the word mercy and grace interchangeably. They're not interchangeable. They mean different things. Grace is giving you something that you don't deserve. Uh, For example, if I just walk up to you randomly and hand you a crisp $100 bill, and that's yours, have it. That's grace. I don't have to do it. I choose to, I give it to you. I'm not going to, so don't come looking for me. (laughs) You're not going to get a Benjamin out of me. Now, if you have a need in your life, maybe, okay. But uh, I'm not going to go out and hand them people Benjamins, okay? Everybody's getting excited, like, woo, do you hear what he said? No, I'm not. <laughs> but that'd be grace. Mercy is different. Uh, the best way I can describe mercy is to kind of get right to the point. Mercy is understanding that if left my own devices, I deserve hell. Scripture says the wages of sin is death. That's what I deserve. I deserve hell period. I don't deserve heaven. I don't deserve Jesus. I don't deserve my life. I don't deserve anything. I deserve hell. That's what the scriptures tell me. Because Jesus has set a plumb line in my life, and he says, Joel, you are so far off the mark. You are hopelessly behind on all this. You have so much sin in your heart, and you are so broken that there is no way you could ever earn salvation, so hell is the only place you can go. That's what I deserve. But in his mercy, God the Father sent Jesus to take that punishment from me. And instead of giving me what, des- what I deserve, Jesus has given me life. Amen. That's mercy. Yeah. That's why we praise him. Grace, of course, yes. But, but mercy is the fact that he has withheld his judgment from us. He has withheld his wrath from us. That we are not objects of his wrath any longer. We are, we are saved by his grace. And that was all done in the context of his mercy that he loved us so much he commuted the death sentence from us that if God is just he has to punish sin and he looks at all of humanity and he says you are covered by the blood of my son not guilty you are covered by the blood of my son not guilty that's mercy that we're declared innocent excuse me we're declared not guilty we're not innocent but we're declared not guilty that's mercy We praise Him for that. And then every few months, we encourage you to write your story. We always encourage you to do this because you never know when the Lord's going to give you a chance to share that mercy with someone else. 
You know, I picked it up from Dave Ramsey originally, but if someone ever says, Joel, how are you doing? I always say, better than I deserve. I heard it from Dave Ramsey first, but I've said it so much it feels like mine now. So I don't know if I can claim it yet. But I don't say that to be fancy or anything. I say that because it's true. I am better than I deserve. I don't deserve anything. The Lord's graciously given it to me, and he's shown me mercy and withheld this death sentence. From, I, I am better than I deserve. But that started because I, I did this one time. I wrote down my story. Now, I had a great childhood. I was raised in a Christian home. I was spared a lot of the pain that so many of you went through. But we all have the story of, when, of who we were, and then Jesus comes along, and now this is who we are. Write that down. Four or five sentences. That, it's just a paragraph, not a book. It's just a paragraph. So that when, when, someone, when you have that moment and someone needs to hear that from you, you can say, hey, I used to be just like that. You would not believe who I was. Wow, what happened? Jesus happened. Yeah. Most amazing thing. And he just came in and he just changed everything. And now I, I live this way because of him. That's your story. That's the story that the northern kingdom of Israel never got. And when the Lord measured them out and they were found out of plumb, the Lord did exile them and they never came back. The southern kingdom of Judah did. That was the lineage of Jesus. But not the northern kingdom, not those 10 tribes up there. They never got it. But our story is one that recognizes that our greatest need is not to be more arrogant about wherever we are on this Christian continuum. Christians should be the most humble people in the world because we know what we've been saved from. And we should be the most humble because we're like, boy, I know what I deserve. But let me tell you about what I got instead. I mean, we should be so different because our greatest need is to recognize his mercy and to live in that mercy, to heed his warning and to put it in our feet and walk that out in front of a world that needs to hear once again that there's a real solution for the arrogance of our heart and that there's something that can fill the greatest need in our life and that is recognizing and receiving his mercy. Let me pray for you, then I want to give you a minute to fill out your connection cards. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for the incredible gift of mercy you have shown to us. And that while we were sinners and far from you and didn't know who you were, before we were even a thought in our parents' eyes, before we were even a thought in their mind, a speck in their eyes, before we ever took our first breath, you died for us. And you showed us that mercy. Help us to live in that mercy to live recognizing which we have been saved from in Jesus name amen